Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I hope you can all hear me and see my screen. I did test it before. I'm not sure if you can show me a thumbs up, maybe, if you can hear me. Thank you. OK, perfect. Thanks so much for uh, spending your Friday afternoon with me. Um, I hope it's going to be an interesting topic. I find it quite interesting. Uh, my name is Rulian and I'm the Regulatory Manager at CropLife. And um, today I'm going to give you some more information and insights on uh, the use of semio chemicals in an integrated pest management program. Um, as always, I'm sure there's lots of people on this call that has a lot of knowledge on these type of products and uh, maybe even more so than me. So if there's anything that I say or you have any questions or you want to debate about it in our chat, uh, you're welcome to do that. Um, unfortunately, everyone is muted, so you wouldn't be able to ask any questions during the webinar. However, I have included my email address at the end. And if you do have any specific questions, you are welcome to contact me after. Um, yeah, so without further ado, um, I'm going to start out oh, and maybe I should just mention the everyone that's doing CPD uh, or po is participating in the CPD program. Um, after the session, you can go and do the questions for the CPD points. OK, perfect. OK, so before we start, I just want to start with a disclosure. Uh, to be able to show the different types of products on the market and the, the various techniques that um, is being used, there are a few products, specific products that are mentioned during the presentation. Uh, these products are not necessarily endorsed by CropLife. It's just merely for demonstration purposes, so please keep this in mind. Um, I've only included products that registry registered locally and I obviously couldn't include examples of all products um, so please just keep that in mind. Um, I also included some photos from international registered products just to show uh, the different technologies that's available and then I just also want to acknowledge insect science because a lot of the photos and diagrams that I've put in my presentation today um, is from Insect Science, and they've also included it on our uh, Sabu Senior Chemical module uh, that we are using um, at CropLife. So uh, I just want to extend a thank you to them for letting me use those pictures as well. Okay, so to start, if we want to talk about senior chemicals and the use of it in an integrated pest management program, of course, we need to understand what do we mean by integrated pest management. Uh, so you would see integrated pest management, and I think everyone's aware that it's usually abbreviated IPM, but essentially it is the use of all available pest control techniques and the subsequent integration of appropriate measures that discourage the development of pest populations. So that means it's not just chemical control, but you would use any type of technique um, to try and keep pest populations below economic threshold levels. So, that, so this can include biological products, chemical applications like pesticides, uh, physical um, like de-weeding physically or crop specific management strategies, so genetically modified crops or using specific cultivars, um, anything that you can think of that you can use to discourage um, pest populations. Essentially, that is what we talk about when we're talking about integrated pest management, to try and use all of those different techniques and then obviously also reduce the amount of chemicals we need to apply. So senior chemicals is an important part of integrated pest management and it can be valuable to, to use as a monitoring and control strategy in an IPM program. So uh, semi chemicals can be used uh, as a monitoring tool 
to optimize the timing of implementing other control me measures, such as chemical intervention. However, similar chemicals can also be used to an extent to keep pest populations below economic threshold levels and consequently also give some measure of control. Whether a semi-chemical can be used for monitoring or pest control is, however, specific to the specific semi-chemical, the pest in question, and the crop situation. Okay, so when we talk about a semi-chemical, what is a semi-chemical? Semi-chemicals are substances or mixtures of substances emitted by plants, animals, and other organisms that evoke a behavioral or physiological response in individuals of the same or other species. Semiochemicals in broad is then subdivided into interspecific interactions, which are called allelochemicals, and intraspecific interactions, which are called pheromones. Okay, so allelochemicals, when we talk about interspecific interactions, we mean that these chemicals are used for communication between different species. So the example I included here is a bee and a flower for pollination. So when a flower emits volatiles that attract the bee to the, to the flower for pollination, that would count as being an allelochemical because it's communication between different species. So when we talk about pheromones, that would be intraspecific interactions, and that is chemicals that's used between individuals of the same species. So for example, we'll also talk about it a lot in today's presentation, sex pheromones, which are used uh, by males and females to find one another for mating purposes. That is a, an example of pheromones. Okay, so let's first look at allelochemicals. So allelochemicals are produced by individuals of one species and modify the behavior of individuals of a different species. So we have various types. I'm just going to give a short list of, of what we mean when we talk about allelochemicals. The first one is alimones. Alimones are chemicals that... Um, where the response is beneficial to the emitter of the substance. Then you get chiromones, uh, where the response is beneficial to the recipient of the chemical. Then you get cinnamones, the response is beneficial to both the releaser and the receiver of the chemical. Antimones, which is maladaptive for both the releaser and the receiver of the chemical and apnemones, uh, which is emitted by a non-living source causing a favorable reaction to a receiving organism. Allelochemicals encompass the attraction of pollinators to flowers, plant insect defense strategies, prey and host plant location. So I've included a few pictures here just to demonstrate what we talk about when we're talking about different allelochemicals. Um, so, for example, when uh, a larvae feeds on a leaf, the leaf will release chemicals into the atmosphere to um, often discourage other, uh, other herbivores from eating it and also inducing response in neighboring plants uh, to introduce defense mechanisms and sometimes uh, insects that then are also predatory on those herbivores are attracted by those volatiles. Uh, then you also have, I don't know if you've ever uh, poked an orange dog, so uh, the, the larvae of the citrus swallowtail. So they have these tentacles that come out when you disturb them and it has a pungent odor. So that is to deter um, predators. And uh, these beetles in the corner, um, so the, the beetles emit uh, a chemical that attracts the predator. Um, and obviously, I've also included a, a bee and a flower um, to show the attraction of pollinators to flowers. 
So we have to remember with allele chemicals in general, these signals are usually not species specific and management strategies using allele chemicals may also therefore affect other non-target organisms. Okay, then let's have a look at pheromones. The pheromones are produced by individuals of a species and modify the behavior of other individuals of the same species. So there's various different pheromones. I've included some examples. The first being sex pheromones, which are the ones that we're going to talk about uh, quite a lot today. So sex pheromones mediate interaction between sexes of the same species and are mainly produced by females to attract males. Then you also get aggregation pheromones, and these pheromones attract individuals of both sexes at food sites and reproductive habitats. Alarm pheromones. Uh, alert members of the same species to the presence of a menace. Oviposition deterrent pheromones, which discourage females from laying eggs in the same resource of another female. Trial pheromones guide social insects to distant food sources. Home recognition pheromones in social insect colonies, the queen produces scent mark to enable workers to recognize her colony. And royal pheromones, this pheromone enables workers to recognize patronage, kings and queens in a, um, a social insect colony. So these are just a few examples. So sex pheromones are the most commonly used in agriculture, and we'll also talk a lot about them today. And then some of them uh, are specific to social insects, the ones that we've highlighted here. Um, and obviously with social insects, there's a lot of communication between species, um, between individuals of the same species because they live together and work together. So that um, goes without saying. Okay, so because pheromones are species specific, management strategies using pheromones do not have a significant impact on other non-target organisms. I've included a few examples of the pheromones that we've listed on the previous page. Um, so in the first example, the sex pheromones, where um, mates use pheromones to locate one another for mating. Um, and then we have aggregation pheromone, where all of the insects aggregate together. We have a queen. Um, obviously, bees have lots of pheromones that they use for communication, so <laughs> I won't even try and delve into that. And then um, you all would have seen uh, ants, for example, walking in a trail, um, which they've marked with uh, pheromones so that they all follow the same trail to, for example, find a food source or their nest. Okay, so we're going to spend the, uh, most of the time talking about pheromones at this stage um, because those are, are the most commonly used uh, and um, just where it all started. So uh, although um, okay, uh, scientists were aware of pheromones for quite some time, it's only in 1959 that the first uh, pheromone was identified from the domestic silk moth and um, produced or, or synthesized in a lab for use uh, commercially. And like I said, although this was the first time a pheromone was isolated and synthesized, the existence of these chemicals were known. And um, before they actually had uh, cages where they kept, uh, for example, female um, insects to lure the males because they knew that the, the females lured the males. But this was obviously the first time that they identified the chemical released from the insect and synthesized it. Okay, so applications in agriculture. So how do we use these uh, senior chemicals in agriculture? Okay, so we can use it for surveillance. And uh, this includes monitoring to see uh, the fluctuations in, in pest numbers over time. And then we can also use senior chemical based strategies for management purposes. So these uh, type of techniques include mass trapping, 
mating disruption, attract and kill, which also includes male annihilation technique, and also push-pull strategies. So going through the presentation, we'll just have a look at each of these individually. Before we do that, though, I'm just going to uh, stop for a moment um, because part of all of these strategies are traps because a lot of these senior chemicals are used to, to lure insects to traps. So therefore, it's also important to um, take the various different traps into account. Okay, so obviously when we lure an insect, um, we need to trap it somehow. And um, although various different traps can be used for different scenarios, there are specific traps that are um, better um, for certain pests, and this could be due to various reasons, um, but often it's due to pest preferences, physiology, and behavior. And it would also matter what the goal is of um, the strategy, what we want to achieve. For example, if you want to monitor, you can use a, a sticky card, but if you want to do mass trapping, sometimes you'll use something, uh, a bigger trap, because you want to um, trap more insects and your sticky card will get full too quickly. Uh, but essentially, you can use these uh, different traps interchangeably, but um, they would, they are optimal traps to use. Okay, so once the insect is lured to the trap, we obviously want to kill it um, if we want to achieve uh, control of the insect. So uh, the first trapping mechanism that we can make use of is physically trapping the insect. Um, so this can be done with a sticky card, for example, which contains a sticky substance. You also get other types of sticky substances in traps where, um, where the insect get trapped, or you can design a trap in such a way that it's difficult for the insect to escape after entering the trap, and that will also be an example of physically trapping the insect. So also um, insecticides, um, sometimes you'll put an insecticide into the trap to um, prevent the insect from escaping after it entered the trap. And then you can also use fluids. So for example, this is a, a water trap and you would um, put water into the trap and then if the insect comes close to the trap, it hopefully falls into the water and gets trapped. Okay, so just to um, stand still on sex pheromones for a bit, um, seeing as it's the most commonly used, I thought I'll just go into a bit more detail on it, just so that we understand the, the way in which it is used, just to use it as a demonstration for all of the different techniques that we'll delve into. So although most strategies described in this presentation can be achieved by other types of senior chemicals, the most commonly used are sex pheromones, which is consequently used in, as an example to describe um, these strategies. Just as an exception, mating disruption, because obviously it affects mating. Um, mating disruption can only be achieved by making use of sex pheromones. Other attractants such as plant volatiles can also be used in other strategies like monitoring, attract and kill, and mass trapping. Sex pheromones are usually produced by the female and it attracts the males. And therefore, when using a sex pheromone as an attractant, usually only males are attracted and trapped. So the best known in agricultural application is straight-chained lepidopteran pheromones, which is produced by the order Lepidoptera, which uh, is the order of insects containing butterflies and moths. And the structure of the majority of known insect pheromones consists of unbranched aliphatics having a chain of 9 to 18 carbons containing up to three double bonds and ending in an alcohol, acetate, or aldehyde functional group. So that's just extra information. <laughs> you don't need to remember that. Okay, so how do sex pheromones work? So the female insect 
emits specific chemicals called sex pheromones into the environment. And the pheromone molecules travel through the air and create a concentration gradient. The male insect of the same species then detects these pheromone molecules using specialized sensory structures, um, such as the antenna. And the signal is then transmitted to the male insect's brain, leading um, to specific behavioral responses, such as flying towards the source of the pheromone. So this is my best attempt at the schematic diagram of a female releasing chemicals, um, which gets carried downwind, and then it creates a concentration gradient, and the male picks up the concentration gradient and follows it to find the female. Okay, so now that we have more or less an idea of how that works, um, let's see what does it entail when we talk about monitoring. Okay, so for monitoring, a trap is baited with a lure impregnated with an attractive senior chemical. Um, the target insect is lured to the trap and killed by either a sticky liner, an insecticide, or a fluid, um, as we, we explained. And these traps, if we're using it for monitoring, are usually inspected regularly to monitor the presence of the target insect in the field and to see the fluctuations in the population density and peak flight activity. And this data can then be used to prioritize uh, when you will put down a, a chemical application or um, do any other type of intervention um, to try and control the pest in the field. So it's a very valuable tool to try and, and optimize other management strategies. Okay, so this is an example of a, a delta trap, which is used for monitoring. Um, so you can see in, in the middle of the trap, there's a rubber septum impregnated with the senior chemical. In this case, it's a pheromone. Uh, the insects you see here are tuta absoluta. So it's a pheromone for, well, it's theromaya absoluta now, but anyway, and then you have a sticky liner. And as the insects are attracted to the pheromone uh, on the septum, they get stuck on this uh, sticky liner with a grid. And this uh, yellow trap is then called a, a yellow delta trap, which contains the sticky liner. You get various different colors of delta traps, depending on the paste that you want to lure, because some of them have different color preferences. So um, then essentially you will use the data that you've gathered. Um, or you'll, you'll take the sticky trap, usually I think on a weekly basis, and you'll count uh, the insects trapped on your sticky card, and then you can monitor differences in the pest population in the field with time. So it's obviously uh, a bit labor intensive, um, but it helps to um, optimize the timing of when you can uh, do other interventions and gives you um, information on economic threshold levels. So for example, if you have a, a, a peak flight activity, or you can see there's there's an um, increase in the population in the field, you can do chemical intervention to try and bring those populations down and keep it below economic threshold levels. So essentially, monitoring allows growers to implement control strategies based on economic threshold values rather than by calendar. And uh, then we just need to remember that sticky traps are used for small insects, like small moths. Um, it's obviously a bit more difficult if you want to monitor bigger moths. You can't use a, a small sticky trap. Um, it wouldn't work as effective, and you'll only catch one or two moths, and then the whole thing would be full of scales, um, because most moths, or all moths, have scales on their wings. So it also affects the stickiness of the trap. You also get other sticky cards that you can use for monitoring. Um, so the sticky surface traps the lured insect. You'd see here, for example, the, the sticky card is also used together with a, with a, um, a lure impregnated there with a, with a semi chemical. Again, it's used for small insects. It can also be used for other insects other than moths like scale insects and mealybugs. 
and it can also be in different colors depending on the target insects. And most of these sticky cards that are used for monitoring have a grid that you can use to um, optimize counting of the insects so that you can keep track of the, the number of insects in the field. Okay, seeing as you can only use those small sticky cards for small insects, you obviously need different types of traps if you want to trap other types of um, insects. Uh, fruit flies, although not as big, uh, are usually trapped by a MacFail trap. So you will see it has a, a cage uh, where you put the lure in and then you also insert an insecticide block um, inside of the, the trap. Usually it's a dichlorophorst block. So dichlorophorst has gas action. So, um, so then it, it uh, dissipates into the, the trap and kills the insects entering. So this trap is specifically designed to catch fruit flies. Uh, such as Ceratitis and Patricera. And the insects fly up to the light um, and then they cannot escape and eventually fall to the bottom of the trap where they are killed by the insecticide. Okay, so because you cannot use the um, sticky trap for big moths, usually you would use a bu bucket funnel trap for bigger moths um, for monitoring purposes. It also contains a lure cage at the top, and uh, you'll also insert a dichlorophorus block um, at the bottom of the trap, killing the insects as they enter the trap. And then you also get a census trap, and this is also used for fruit flies. Um, and it's also, you also put a dichlorophorus block inside killing the insect as it enters, and the lure can be placed on the inside of the trap. Okay, then we're going to move over to mass trapping, which is the first of our management strategies. So mass trapping is, in a way, not that different from monitoring, except that the purpose is different. Um, but mass trapping also works on the same principle. That it attracts the best species to a trap where it is killed, eliminating males or females from the population, depending on the attractant that is used, which leads to retardation of population growth. The so way it is different from monitoring is uh, the density of traps is increased. So if you have more traps, you'll obviously catch more insects. So in general, where monitoring uses one trap every two to five hectares, mass trapping uses 20 to 40 traps per hectare. And this is dependent obviously on the crop and pest situation. And obviously you have to conform to what the, the label says. This is just an indication showing that you usually use more traps per hectare if you want to, um, if your purpose is mass trapping rather than monitoring. Um, it does, however, require continuous maintenance as the traps are saturated with captured insects. Okay, so this schematic diagram shows uh, how the concept works. So essentially each of the traps um, would lure insects to the trap. And like we said, if you um, use monitoring, you would use less traps, but now, you would put out lots of traps to try and catch as many insects as possible, um, essentially uh, mass trapping a lot of the population. Okay, so you can use the same uh, type of traps for, for mass trapping than you do for monitoring. Um, so this is again the bucket funnel trap, which can be used for larger moth species. And then obviously you just need to put out more of the traps per hectare to achieve mass trapping. And for mass trapping, we also use the, the water trap um, and that was mentioned before where you include a, a liquid. So the, it has a lure cage in the middle where you put the lure and then you insert water into the, the trap. And you can also add an adjuvant to break the water tension, um, which just uh, makes it 
a bit more uh, effective at catching the insects as they um, they get caught in the water uh, much more effectively. And uh, that's an example of a water trap in the field, um, also uh, with containing tuta absoluta. Okay, then the next strategy we're looking at is mating disruption. Okay, so mating disruption uses species specific experiments that affect mating behavior by releasing huge amounts of synthetic pheromones into the atmosphere. So for monitoring and mass trapping and also the other techniques that we'll look at, usually you use very low concentrations of the pheromone that mimic natural emissions. So obviously if you're attracting a pest, for example, with a pheromone, then you would want to release the amount that a female insect uh, would release naturally to attract the male. So in this regard, you wouldn't use the same um, concentration as is um, present naturally in the environment, but you would saturate the atmosphere with quite a high concentration of the pheromone. So unlike the, the other techniques that we just looked at, mating disruption, is not used together with a trap or an insecticide. And so the, the goal of the technique is to disrupt mating and uh, by reducing mating events, reduce the population, not by actually directly killing an insect, uh, luring it and killing it like with the traps. So there's four different mechanisms of mating disruption. Uh, it's a bit complicated, but we're going to oversimplify it. So you get competitive attraction, also called false trail following. Um, Semiochemical substances draw the attention of the males away from wild females, thereby following a false trail. So essentially it uh, distracts the males away from the females. Then you get confusion of males. Confusion occurs due to saturation of the environment with the senior chemical substance, causing random flight patterns and thereby missing the female position and effectively blocking mating. You can also get sensory desensitization. This is adaptation of the male antennal receptor system or habituation of the central nervous system as neurophysiological effect processing due to overexposure to the semiochemical substance. So it's, it's a result of continuous and high background concentrations. So this is similar to going somewhere, smelling something and then being in that environment for a long time and you can no longer smell it. Okay, and then disguised immigration of males prior to mating. The males immigrate from the area due to the excess pheromone causing them to be unavailable for mating with virgin females. Okay, so this is just a simple uh, schematic diagram showing uh, more or less how it works. So in a normal situation, the female releases, releases the pheromone and the male would find the female uh, by following the pheromone bloom. However, in the case of mating disruption, you would have a device um, that releases a lot of the pheromone, essentially masking the female from, from the male and uh, the male cannot find the female um, as he cannot follow the pheromone blue. This is another schematic diagram uh, showing how the male uh, finds the pheromone bloom and as it reaches the pheromone source, which is then not the, the female, it's, it's the mating disruption device. The male departs and um, the male sometimes does not recover. So a sensory blockage occurs and the, the male cannot detect the pheromone anymore, um, but sometimes they recover and then they can uh, again find the pheromone bloom. But if it's again a mating disruption source rather than a female, this obviously distracts the male from finding the female, essentially resulting in less mating events. 
Okay, so this is various different um, products in the market using uh, different techniques to achieve mating disruption. Uh, the first is passive devices or dispensers. And then you also get active devices uh, called buffers. And then you have what's called uh, splat technology. So I'll have a quick look at uh, all of these different techniques. So passive devices first. Okay, so this is a, a, an example of a, a passive device that I know we have some registered uh, in South Africa. So it's essentially a, a tube that's impregnated with a pheromone that you hang in the, in the field and that releases the pheromone accomplishing a mating disruption. Then you also get specific uh, devices uh, that you hang in the field uh, that's constantly releasing uh, pheromones into the environment. Um, you'll also see that in, in most cases uh, for pheromone type products, you will have to dispense it high up in a tree because the pheromones uh, usually travel downwind and are heavier than air. So you would want it to travel as far as possible by putting it as high up in the tree as possible. Um, other passive devices, you get these spiral tubes um, that you can uh, put around a, a branch and that's also impregnated with the pheromone. Then you get active devices called buffers. So these essentially contain the pheromone and uh, every now and then it releases uh, the pheromones into the atmosphere, keeping the, the atmosphere saturated with the pheromone. And then we have SPLAT technology. SPLAT technology essentially um, has these uh, formulation that is placed into the field. That is a formulation that constantly releases the pheromone into the field, uh, effectively causing mating disruption. Okay, then the next technique that we'll look up at is the tract and kill, uh, which also includes the, the male annihilation technique. The tract and kill is a tactic used for trapping and simultaneously killing the captured insects. Um, although some of the other techniques that we looked at do the same, um, this is specific when we refer to um, the, the attractant incorporated with, a, with an insecticide. Uh, so the insect is attracted to the formulation and then killed by an insecticide. And you get these sometimes as a ready to use formulation. Um, but you can also buy attractants and insecticides separately and then uh, mix it before application. So the attract and kill technique essentially uh, works by uh, attracting the insect to the formulation um, containing the insecticide. And then as the insect reaches the, the attractants and the insecticide, it will be killed on contact. So you get, like I said, different types of attract and kill products. Sometimes they're ready to use formulations that you can apply in the fields containing, in this case, a pheromone and an insecticide to kill the insect as it reaches uh, the attractant. But you also get protein food baits, for example, protein hydrolysate liquid um, used to attract uh, fruit flies, and then you can mix it with a suitable insecticide um, that's registered and apply it in the field to attract fruit flies and kill them on contact. Okay, and then the male annihilation technique um, is also an attract and kill tactic. Um, and it is essentially used for Patricera dorsalis. Um, it contains an attractant and also an insecticide, in this case, malathion, um, also called macaptothion. It's the same. Um, so the insect is attracted to the device, and as it reaches the device, it's killed on contact. Um, and it's important to remember that the insecticides used in attract and kill techniques must be relatively fast acting 
and should obviously work even when the insect has only made brief contact with it. So um, you're also quite limited to the type of insecticides that you can use in these technologies. And the last type of strategy that we're going to look at is the push-pull strategy. So this strategy is called the stimulant deterrent diversion tactic. It's a combination of deterred or repellents from the crops and the tractor stimuli by lures that control the insect pest by trapping or killing tactics. The strategy requires knowledge of the insect's biology, chemical ecology, and the interactions between host plants and natural enemies. And the strategy is being used in parts of Africa for the management of stem borers, making use of intercrops and trap crops. So essentially, when using a push-pull strategy, you would want to use something that pushes the insect away from uh, the crop that you want to protect and pull it towards something else, for example, a trap crop where um, you can, for example, uh, use an insecticide on the trap crop to kill the insects that's lured there or, or various different other techniques. So this is a, an example of how it's used uh, to uh, deter insects from, from maize plants by using a repellent plant to remove it from where the maize is growing and trap plants that are attractive to the insect, thus they are repelled by the repellent plant and then attracted by a trap plant, um, essentially keeping the population low in the, in the crop that you're trying to protect. So various different uh, techniques can be used to, to achieve this, and um, you can use uh, different means to push an insect out of the, the crop that you're trying to protect. For example, visual distractions, non-host volatiles, anti-aggregation pheromones, alarm pheromones, oviposition deterrence, and anti -feedance. And then you can also use something that would attract the insect to a trap crop that achieves the pull part of the push-pull strategy. And this could be visual stimulants, host volatiles, aggregation pheromones, sex pheromones, oviposition stimulants, and gustatory stimulants. Okay, so the advantages and the disadvantages of using semi-chemicals in pest control. So you'd see I listed target specificity both as an advantage and a disadvantage. So obviously it's a great advantage if you want to control a specific pest. Um, however, if you think of sometimes using an insecticide to kill various different uh, pests at once, you now can only control one pest um, with your senior chemical based strategy, uh, specifically pheromones. Another advantage is reduced risk of residues. So because you are going to hopefully optimize your sprays and um, not use calendar sprays, you would use less chemicals and you could also uh, try and keep the, the population below economic threshold levels and therefore use less chemicals, which results in less residues. Um, and then also reduced chemical exposure if you're using less chemicals to, for example, the, the laborers that's applying chemicals. And uh, most of the, the chemicals identified for use in um, agriculture as senior chemicals have minimal impact on humans and, and other non-target species. And uh, another advantage of using senior chemicals is it has a cumulative effectiveness. So if you keep on using the, the um, control measures over multiple generations, you usually see uh, a decrease in, in your populations over time. And because you're using um, a, a chemical that's not as um, the selection pressure is quite low or lower as for uh, an insecticide, you have a reduced risk of resistance development. And usually you have a, no re-entry interval after um, making use of 
senior chemicals and applying senior chemical measures in the field. Some disadvantages of using senior chemicals. So it requires significant initial, initial investment and research. And even though this is the case also for lots of pesticides, uh, it's, it's, quite, uh, in, it's quite specific to the, the scenario, the insect, the crop. Uh, it, it takes a lot of research uh, to get to the, um, to the product that you're going to use eventually. So it takes just as long or longer to, to develop a product. Um, it's not effective against all pests, so all insects are not necessarily um, olfactory stimulated and cannot necessarily be controlled by making use of senior chemicals, so it can only be used for certain pests. Uh, it's usually slow acting compared to insecticides, so you won't uh, necessarily apply uh, the product today or use it today and see a decrease in the population tomorrow. Uh, as with insecticides, it usually takes uh, quite some time to see the, the results. Also, because the, the volatile chemicals used in these products are very volatile, so you have to um, often use cold storage to keep the products viable for a long period of time. Otherwise, the volatiles dissipate and, and the product doesn't work anymore, so you need cold storage. And if you want to, for example, do uh, monitoring and mass trapping and all of that, it can sometimes be quite uh, labor intensive. Okay, so then I'm just gonna also give you a, an overview of how you identify senior chemicals for pest control strategies. Um, and this is just the scientist in me that finds this fascinating. So I hope you find it fascinating too. I'll try and not go into too much detail. Okay, so a lot of research, research goes into identifying senior chemicals that can be used in agricultural uh, settings and for monitoring and control of pest species. As we mentioned, not all insects respond strongly to senior chemicals. And often an attractive blend of compounds are needed, not just a single compound. Uh, these blends need to be released at a specific rate and in specific ratios. So it can become quite complex to, to identify that blend and exactly the, the quantities that you need to um, achieve attraction and to ensure that it's released at the, the right rate and in the right ratios. Okay, so both pheromones and allelic chemicals can be investigated for use in senior chemical based management strategies. So if we look at pheromones, pheromones are, like we said, species specific and can be used in minute quantities as they are attractive at the same concentration as would be released naturally in the environment. And this is obviously not the case for mating disruption um, but for all other uh, control measures where we want to attract the insect, we use, we use the same concentration as what, what would be used naturally. So if we make use of yellow chemicals, however, such as those plant volatiles, um, these are usually not species specific and would be attractive to several herbivorous species. It's not always the case, but um, sometimes, most often, and often these uh, chemicals, if you use them, are required in higher concentrations than um, would be detected uh, in a natural environment. And this is because there's obviously lots of plants in the environment where you use these um, measures. So there would be a lot of background levels of these chemicals already in the environment. Okay, so step one, I've obviously oversimplified this, but just uh, as a more or less to give an idea of how uh, you would go about identifying a senior chemical for a product. So first we need to determine whether the insect is attracted to the source being investigated. And as we said, this could be a host plant volatile, uh, volatiles that are released by prey uh, to lure predators, um, pheromones, whichever um, type of uh, chemical you're going to investigate. 
um, you need to determine whether the insect is attracted to the volatiles being released by the source and all other stimuli, stimuli that could contribute to attraction must be eliminated. So you need to ensure that if something is attracted to a specific source, it is actually based on the olfactory cues um, that they can detect, and it's not something else like, for example, visual cues. So how do we do this? This is done by making use of an olfactometer or a wind tunnel in the case of flying insects. So just for fun, this is more or less what a basic olfactometer setup looks like. Um, it will depend on the type of insects that you're going to uh, use and the type of volatile that you're investigating to use as a um, semi-chemical in a, in a product. So for example, this is a, the, a wide tube olfactometer. It's a glass tube. Um, and you would enter the insect that you're investigating um, or the best insect for which you want to then uh, develop a control strategy. You would put it um, into the base of the olfactometer and then you have different sources of volatiles. So in this case, there's a, a grapevine plant and a control control is always necessary because you'll obviously have volatiles that um, that's in the air regardless so you need to have a uh, to determine whether it's actually the grapevine plant that's attracting the insect uh, these are just flow meters to um, regulate the flow of air and the air gets pushed through a charcoal filter to clean the air of other impurities and other um, odors before it goes into the olfactometer and this is a pump that then pushes air through this whole system uh, to reach the insect on the other side. And as I say, the control treatment is always necessary. So this is a bit close up. So here you can see the olfactometer and the insect that was placed inside the olfactometer. This is a little leaf hopper. Um, and you can see it makes a decision on the side of the olfactometer that it chooses. And then we can uh, record that and see if it chooses that side significantly more than the control option. And in that way, determine whether it seems to be attracted to the grapevine plant or not. And you can obviously, instead of the grapevine plant, that's just an example, you can use any other host plant or you can use a female insect that releases a a sex pheromone and split the males in the olfactometer. So essentially that is how you would then determine whether the insect is attracted to the odor source or not. So once we have determined that the insect is actually attracted to the odor source, you want to determine what volatiles um, are released by the odor source that could potentially be an attractant for the insect. So these are grapevine plants um, in baking bags, and they are essentially um, air is pushed into the bag and pulled out of the bag through an absorbent, collecting the volatiles that the plant releases. So if the insect is attracted to the volatile organic, organic compounds released by the source used in olfactometer tests, these volatile compounds are collected from the source for further analysis and volatile compounds are collected with an adsorbent material. I won't go into detail about what that means, but this is a schematic diagram of the picture that I just showed. Essentially, you would uh, have, again, a charcoal filter to clean the air as it enters the system, and then you have your, um, your source of volatiles that you're investigating, and um, it he has a, a pull pump, so this pump pulls air through an adsorbent. Um, just to show you what it looks like, it's essentially a glass tube filled with adsorbent material. And as the, the air from the, um, from the bag goes through the adsorbent, those volatiles are then collected in the adsorbent, um, which can be used for further analysis. Okay, so the volatiles released by the source is now in the adsorbent material. 
and then an appropriate solvent is used to elute these compounds from the absorbent for further investigation. So you can then take these uh, volatiles outside of the absorbent for further investigation. Okay, so responses to volatile compounds are then confirmed using gas chromatography coupled with an electroantennographic detector. No, it's a very big word, <laughs> um, but don't worry. It's uh, just for fun that I'm giving you this information. I hope you find it as fun as I do. <laughs> and the volatile compounds in the solvent is injected into the GC. Uh, GC stands for gas chromatography um, machine. Um, so essentially, the, the, ga the gas chromatography machine splits the sample that you've collected with the various volatiles into different components, um, which I'll show in just a bit. Um, and a gas is used, so you get different chromatography um, methods. And this is gas chromatography because obviously the compounds that we are working with are very volatile. So um, we want we essentially use uh, it in its volatile form and analyze it in its volatile form. So uh, while we're uh, sending the, the compounds through the gas chromatography machine, we simultaneously um, take an insect antenna and connect it to an electroantennagram, um, which I'll show you what it looks like now. And the gas chromatography machine splits the blend of compounds into its individual components, which relies on differences in the physical and chemical properties of the compounds, such as the mass and the polarity of the compounds, to which the insect antenna is subsequently exposed. The electroantennagram measures a voltage difference in the antenna when a volatile compound induces a physiological response. So that's when the insect detects the compound, indicating potential chemicals for further investigation. Okay, so I know that was very complicated, but uh, just in essence, so essentially this is a gas chromatography machine and essentially what it does is if you take your volatiles that you've now collected from the grapevine plant and you inject it with its solvent into the machine, it's an oven and it contains a column um, and those compounds are split according to different characteristics of the chemicals which essentially allows the chemicals to be split from one another so that you can have one or two chemicals eluting um, at a time and not the whole blend of chemicals at once so that you can detect whether an insect detects a specific compound in that blend. And this is coupled to the electroantennagram machine, which um, is what we use to see if the, the insect can actually detect the molecule that um, came out of the sample that we've collected from the plants. So this is a schematic diagram of what we've looked at, and I hope it still makes sense. Um, so this is the gas chromatography machine. This is the column through which you inject the sample, and then it, um, the sample essentially comes out of this tube. And like I said, um, each of the volatile components are now split. So the, um, the a volatile compound comes out of the, the tube uh, one compound at a time or very few compounds at a time. And that that you can see in this picture is the insect antenna. So essentially you use the insect antenna to detect uh, the compounds. So you need the insect antenna to be alive. So you would cut off the antenna, you would put it into the microelectrodes, and you would run the sample onto the antenna, and you would be able to see as soon as the compound comes out of the machine whether the antenna can actually detect it or not. This is the results from such a test. So you would see this is the FID, which is the flame ionizing detector, which you don't need to remember. <laughs> but essentially, that is the, um, the different uh, compounds in your sample. And this is 
each of these stripes here is essentially a compound eluting from your system out of the gas chromatography machine. And then this is the graph showing the electro antennagram detector. And this shows the voltage difference on the antenna. And you can see when this, these two molecules eluted from the, the sample, the insect had a voltage difference on its antenna here, showing that the insect can detect those molecules that came out of the sample. So essentially, that is all it means. So then you need to identify the compounds that has uh, eluted out of the, the system. And this you do with a, a mass spect spectrometer. Um, so essentially, mass, mass spectrometry is an analytical technique that is used to measure the mass to charge ratio of ions. And the results are presented as a mass spectrum, a plot of intensity as a function of the mass to charge ratio. And the resulting fragmentation pattern is compound specific and can be used for identification. Again, a very complicated <laughs> um, section, but essentially what it does is it takes the compound as it eluted out of the gas chromatography machine. It fires a bunch of electrons at it. It breaks the compound up into its smallest components. And those components are specific for each compound. So that fragmentation pattern. So if you look at the last sentence, the fragmentation patter, pattern that results is compound specific and can be used for identification. And this is essentially what it looks like. This is four different compounds and their mass spectrometer uh, signature, for example. Uh, it's a fragmentation pattern and that would be specific for each compound. Um, and you can match it to a library to see what compound it is. You obviously have to also then use an analytical standard to confirm it. But anyway, that's just for interest's sake. <laughs> okay, so you've now identified the compounds that induced a response, and you've confirmed with mass spectrometry and analytical standards uh, what compound it is that induced a response in your insect. Now, once you have the compounds identified, you have to determine the optimal ratio of these compounds, especially if there's more than one. You also have to confirm behavioral responses with these isolated compounds in a laboratory and a field setting and investigate various techniques of application. So how can you use it? Can you use it uh, for mating disruption? Can you use it uh, for mass trapping? Um, do you use it with, with a trap or not? So you'll have to investigate how you can use it. Of course, if you are going to develop a product, the only way that you can develop a product is if you can produce these chemicals synthetically. If you can't produce them synthetically or have a, a relatively cheap and easy way to do it, you cannot sell a product um, or make a product containing these chemicals. So that is a whole other ball game that takes a lot of effort um, to develop. And then um, after you have your active ingredient, which is your pheromone or other semi-chemical that you're using for attraction, you obviously have to formulate a product. So you have to identify the necessary co-formulants uh, to have a final product. These could often, for these type of products, uh, entail UV protectors so that the, the compounds don't break down. Um, something that might control the release rate of these chemicals into the atmosphere. And if you're doing an attract and kill technique, for example, you'll have to decide uh, what insecticides to include in your product. And then only at the end, you can register your product. Okay, so that brings us to the registration of semiochemical based remedies. So uh, as most of you would be aware, um, agricultural remedies are regulated under the Fertilizers, Farm Feeds, Agricultural Remedies and Stock Remedies Act, which is Act number 36 of 1947. So if you look under the Act at the definition of an agricultural remedy, an agricultural remedy means any chemical, substance or biological remedy 
or any mixture or combination of any structure or remedy intended or offered to be used for the destruction, control, repelling, attraction, or prevention. So I'll just stop there. But essentially, you can see if you take the definition from the act, a semiochemical based product that you want to uh, make a claim that it controls or repels or attracts a pest, you have to register it under the act. So we obviously know that uh, semiochemicals are different to other chemical pesticides. Um, so we also have a guideline on the data requirements for registration of biologicals or biopesticides in South Africa. And in that guideline, it does mention senior chemicals and states that re reduced residue data requirements may be applicable. No residue data are required where the products or devices, such as pheromone traps, do not come into contact with the plant parts. Okay, and then um, the active ingredients used must not be of toxicological significance in relation to human and environmental health. So essentially, if you're not applying the product directly to the crop, uh, you don't have to do residue analysis to register a product. And then if you look at the Department of Health, and their guidelines uh, for toxicological assessment. You will see that they also have a, a segment on pheromones and pheromone traps. And they say that these chemicals may be exempted from toxicological assessment when used for arthropod pest control under conditions as described in paragraph A, B, C, and D of this guideline. So I'm not going to go through all of it, but essentially there are scenarios where you do not have to do a toxicological assessment for senior chemicals, seeing as they are often not applied directly onto the, the crop and uh, therefore not really, um, humans are not really exposed to it in, in the sense that they would be exposed to other chemical pesticides. Uh, further, if you look at the OECD series on pesticides, they have a document, a guidance document for the registration of pheromones and other senior chemicals, where they mention the following. In developing a regulatory approach for arthropod senior chemicals, the inherent differences between these products and conventional chemical pesticides were taken into consideration. The New Chemicals Act, by modifying behavior of the pest species rather than killing it, are more target-specific than conventional insecticides, are used at concentrations close to those in nature, and dissipate rapidly. For these reasons, it is expected that most senior chemical products pose lower potential risk to human health and the environment than conventional pesticides. So... The rationale for reduced data requirements for senior chemicals can be attributed to the following. The application rate is typically low and probably comparable to natural emissions. Volatility and rapid environmental transformation minimize residues in crops and exposure of non-target organisms. And they are of low toxicity to mammals. SCLPs just refers to um, the lepidopteran pheromones that we spoke about, straight chain lepidopteran pheromones, which are the most common, but essentially pheromones in general of low toxicity to mammals. So even though these products need to be registered under the Act, uh, we do believe, as do most other countries, that they have different registration requirements and that they don't necessarily need to go um, the same route as other pesticides. Uh, but it needs to be specific to the scenario. For example, if you think of a pheromone um, where you're doing registrations, you might only need to collect efficacy data for the pest and not for each crop because um, it's pest specific and not crop specific. So essentially, we are working on guidelines for registration to, um, to be specific for senior chemical based products. Um, so uh, we still need to register it, uh, we feel, so that we can um, ensure that it's effective for uh, the, the reason 
it's being sold um, so that we can ensure farmers are not sold snake oils and products that don't, do not work. It has to be safe and um, therefore we, we still believe that registration is necessary, but it should be specific to the type of products. So CropLife South Africa and SABU, um, which is the biopesticides organization, have a collaborative working group that's currently looking into drafting a senior chemical specific guideline for registration. Um, so anyone that is interested in joining that working group can contact Hannah Lett, which is the chair of that working group. Um, so we will hopefully soon have clear guidelines on how to register these products in South Africa. Also, just interesting to remember is because these re remedies are considered agricultural remedies, they are registered with L numbers like pesticides, and they can also be found on Agri-Intel. And the easiest way to find them is if you look at the category, and if you go to category, you can select senior chemical attractants and senior chemicals, mating disruption, and repellents to see all of the different senior chemical based products uh, registered in the country. That's um, obviously on Agri Intel. Some companies obviously do not provide their labels to Agri Intel, but most of our member companies and those that are registered are on there. Um, so please make use of it. And that is the end of my presentation. Um, it's You can be <laughs> very glad I did not have a lot of time, so it's not three hours. Um, but thank you so much for uh, staying and, and for listening to me being a scientist and giving you way more information, probably that's too technical that you don't need to know. Um, but just uh, also another thank you to Insect Science who provided a lot of the, the pictures. Um, and also to Sabu uh, for the module they've created for CropLife, um, which assisted me also in, in drafting this presentation. Thanks, everyone. I hope you have a, a lovely Friday. And please remember to do the CPD assessment for those people um, that are uh, doing the CPD points. Thanks, everyone. Bye.